This Choircast podcast episode is brought to you by The Wisdom of Hobbits by me, Matthew J. DiStefano. In this hopeful yet at times poignant homage, I focus on everyone's favorite halfling friend, the Hobbit. A charming people, this Shire-based race has captivated, enthralled, and enchanted the hearts and minds of millions. And though they're not a religious society, I argue that spiritual truths, love, kindness, generosity, hope, and even compassion can be found within their familiar yet still relevant and didactic tales. So come and enter a world of adventure and intrigue. Whether it's your first foray into Middle Earth or the Shire is your second home, allow me to inspire you toward discovering your own inner hobbit. Available now on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or wherever you get your fine, fine books. From Choir Publishing. Western Christianity has spent the last 2,000 years telling everyone they're separated from God. This is Not Church with John and Nat Turney. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. My name is Nat Turney. I'm here with my brother John, as always, who is currently nestled in the, uh, in the, in the mountains of Northern California, surrounded by snow and uh, spotty internet. So say hi, John. Hi, John. That's all I get. <laughs> I, I, I was growing tired of the. I can't. I'm not creative enough to think of something else. It's like say, uh, "Wham a lama ding dong, John." Wham a lama ding dong, John. There you go. <laughs> anyway, we're uh, we're the we are the podcast, the uh, silly podcast called "This Is Not Church." Because if it was church, you would have what, John? Left by now. Absolutely. <laughs> and we would have followed you out because that seems like an appropriate move these days. But anyway, we are here today with an amazing guest. So let me get right to it. I'm going to read a quick, quick bio uh, and then we're just going to jump into a conversation. So this is uh, Ariel Astoria. Is it Ariel or Ariel? I'm so sorry. I should have asked you. No, you, you said it right. You said it right the first time. Okay. Ariel. Ariel. All right. She's a speaker, model, an actor, a poet. And she self-published two collections of poetry called Vagabond. One is Vagabonds and Zealots, and the other, Right Bloody, Spill Pretty. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Goodness. Okay. This is why John should just take this whole task back, because <laughs> I can maybe stumble through one. Anyway, both those titles sound awesome. Uh, she shared her work through spoken word and keynote talks with companies such as Google, Lululemon, TEDx, and more. She lives in Los Angeles with her husband. So welcome to the podcast, Ariel. Thank you. Thanks for having me. We should also mention that she has a new book coming out. I should, and it wasn't on the thing. So Sorry. I, I'm like, a, I'm like, a, I'll only read. Oh, you know what? I, I just realized I'm like the guy from Bruce Almighty that Steve Carell played. <laughs> I'll only read what's on the teleprompter. Uh-huh. So, no more, no less. So, so like they'd screw with him by putting a question mark in there. Earthquake <laughs> in Los Angeles? <laughs> you know who's going to read what's on the teleprompter. Why do we do this to him? So that's me, John. If you want me to read it, man, it's going to have to be in the teleprompter. So <laughs> well, the new book is out and it is called what, John? That's called The Unfolding, An Invitation to Come Home to Yourself. Now, yeah, when you say in. it is out, we will have this, this, this podcast will be dropped after the release after. date. So we are, uh, we are actually talking before the release date, but everyone who gets to hear this lovely conversation, it will be the Monday after. The, the dropping of the, pod, of, of the book. Yeah, so we are just trying our very best to, uh, to prove uh, Albert Einstein's relative, special relativity, the warping of space-time, so that by the time mm-hmm. this drops, this book will have... That was terrible. That was really bad. Yeah. We'll talk about... Let's talk about the warping of space-time. I think it was no, interesting. No, let's not. Let's, let's not. not do that. All right. No. I'm going to stop talking for a minute and let you uh, jump in and tell us a little bit more about yourself, more than what the bio said. Uh, we are a... You know, for lack of a better term, we are a sort of a, uh, we're a podcast that explores faith from, from different facets. John and I both, um, find ourselves outside the church these days, but firmly in, inside of the, uh, of the Jesus follower camp. But anyway, I'm curious, I always curious about people's spiritual journeys if they have one. Um, I shouldn't assume everyone does, but if you wouldn't mind kind of, I don't know, speaking to us about that for a second. Yeah. Um, so we were chatting earlier. I'm born and raised Bay Area. I am the daughter of a Baptist pastor and director um, in the Bay Area. I'm the oldest of five kids. Um, so I grew up in in the church. My dad, my parents were youth pastors at first, and then they were pastors. And that happened around my 13th year of life is when we all moved um, to, to seminary where my dad went to school. My mom followed suit shortly after, and then they became lead pastors at a small Baptist church in Richmond, um, California. 
about five, six years after that. And they've been pastors since. And then now my dad serves more as a director. And so, yeah, I think um, I've always known the concept of God within an evangelical slash Baptist world. I knew I was not Baptist pretty immediately when there was discussion around how and women can't show up. And I was like, oh, this this not this not for me. Uh, so I learned <laughs> that very quickly um, that that was not the route for me. That that was not um, part of who I felt I was meant to be or who I felt I was called to be. And then I went to a private Christian university for college, and that was my attempt to stay in um, this faith based world before I was put out in in the bigger world. And now I'm about seven eight years post grad and have unraveled and un folded a lot of that, um, hence hence the book um, itself. And so um, now I sit in a space of having married someone who um, wasn't active in the church, who, you know, was so good at asking questions, at um, being um, so wondrous about the concept of God and about the ideas of faith in ways that were so unfamiliar and yet enticing to me. And then I have a lot of experiences along the way of just the conversation I say getting bigger. Um, I find myself in a space of yes and when it comes from comes to terms with faith and what that means and spirituality, what that looks like and learning that it's not as rigid or as certain as I was made or taught and raised to believe. I love every single bit of that. That's that's amazing because when you when you start talking about God in terms of duality and God in terms of these sort of binary choices we've been forced into, right? That's because that, that, that's my, that's my beef with, with religion. And I always sort of put religion in quotes because, you know, in my, in my version of the, like the worst iteration of, of religion, um, number one paints God as dualistic and then also sort of forces us into this constant state of binary choices, either or, either or all the time. And then the response that you had to the, well, it's more of a yes and, mm-hmm. you know, it, you know, I like that, you know, and, and that's been my, uh, it's been my journey ever since discovering people like Richard Rohr and discovering people, you know, who are more contemplative and who are more, you know, and then reading a book by a guy like Pete Enns called The Sin of Certainty that just kind of gets me beyond this whole need that I think religion also foists upon us, a need to be right and a mm-hmm. need to have things figured out and not to be able to stand and wonder and go, oh, I don't know, all of, like all of this is huge and yeah. complicated and it's okay if I don't understand all of it. It keeps us from being dogmatic. And so I love that. I just, I all of that to say, thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate it. I, when I ask you about a spiritual journey, you say you're the, you're the, you're the kid of a, of a Baptist preacher. I'm like, okay, well, clearly you, <laughs> that, that means, yes, you, you've had some experience in this. Uh, and what age were you when you, when you made that, that, I guess, when you sort of became aware that there was no place for, for women in the way that you thought there should be inside the Baptist church? I mean, were you pretty young? Yeah. Um, pretty, I mean, I'm, so I'm the oldest of five kids. So I have a little bit more of like awareness of, of the transition of my parents from not being ministry affiliated at all to being heavily ministry affiliated. And, and so I was about, um, going into my, um, middle school into high school by the time, um, my parents were at our, at the Baptist church, um, that they were pastoring at at that time. And I remember very clearly weeks before it was for Father's Day and a 12-year-old boy got to preach from the pulpit. And then weeks after that, my mom was set up to preach uh, for Mother's Day. And there was a whole board meeting discussion on whether or not she could preach from the pulpit or not. And I remember being so confused um, by why that was a meeting and a discussion one weeks before that uh, a boy, you know, that s- significantly younger than my mother or her experience, why that was a conversation. And I watched that come to fruition by that Mother's Day where she preached from the floor and and sat in that space of like having been very involved in theater and performance and stage um, aspects by that point in my life, knowing that this was a probably the direction I was going to go and automatically seeing like this does not fit um, because they see me as someone who can't be on that stage 
when I know everything inside of me is meant to be on that stage and not necessarily preaching in that sense. I knew having ministry parents, I was like, I'm going to do this differently. I'm going to do this in a way. I'm not trying to be a pastor and I'm not trying to be a pastor's wife. You know, I, I stood very, very sure in that, but I knew that arts and creativity was my way um, to kind of expand the conversation and to have conversations about God in, in a, in a bigger and different way. So I knew that probably about teenage high school going into, going into college that that tradition in itself, that denomination in itself. And to this day, there's a New York Times article that came out earlier this week where a church was expelled because they brought on a woman teaching pastor. And I just was like, we're, and we're still having these conversations. That was, that was right. Saddleback, right? Wasn't that? That was Saddleback Church. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which, and, a, and a handful of others um, yeah. between the I mean, they, just got, they just got booted from the Southern Bas- Baptist Convention. Yes, because Which, they brought on a female pastor. Yeah, it, break, it breaks my heart that they're going to appeal that. I think I, I don't know why you'd. Bother. I wouldn't appeal it. I would like, yeah, you know, sure. fuck y'all. Uh, we're but moving Rick on. has been a bit yeah. of an outsider forever. So yeah, and that's um, what's, that's what's so shocking to me is like I'm not a big Rick Warren fan. No, mm-hmm. but the but, SBC has to realize he's always been kind of an outsider, even within their within their definitely. conference, right? So for him to, yeah, but he went too far. To ordain a yeah. woman as a pastor. Does, yeah, exactly. I mean, they, they just, that's, that's a line in the sand, right? That's yeah, a line why, in the why sand. Is, why is that line the one that he finally crossed? Mm. It, right. it, 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 it makes you wonder. Oh, actually, don't, I don't wonder, but it, it, I think it, I think it drags out into the daylight what the biggest issue at the SBC is. And mm. it is their view of women and their role in, you know, in, in ministry and life. And, well, you that, know. And, yeah. Well, and I don't, I'm sure you both remember this. So Rick Warren did, he had interviews with both, dang it, I'm going to forget. It was Barack Obama and whoever he was running against. He How did. dare he? Uh, but he, he had Barack Obama come to the Saddleback Church and have a conversation about mm. his presidential campaign. Wow. And I watched it because even though I wasn't a big Rick Warren fan, but sure. obviously there was a lot of pushback specifically from the white evangelical church, right? That right. he would even talk to him. And he did bring up a couple points that the Democratic Party would stand on. And his one of the ones was his stance on abortion. And I remember that Barack's response was, it's a little bit above my pay grade, <laughs> which I thought was a great answer mm-hmm. because basically what he's saying is, I don't really have it. I don't have any say in this. I'm a man. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not a woman, and I'm not God. Who are the Who are the two people who, if you want to call God a person, are the are the ones that have to reckon with whatever potentially right? Which we could get into that whole debate. And but there was like just listening to the the conservative right. Oh, he bowed out. He didn't want to have. He didn't want to answer the question. He gave a really glib answer. I thought it was a great answer. And basically, it was this is none of my business. <laughs> and, but sure, you know yeah. the white evangel, and, and we're we're seeing this even continuing today, right? Um, yeah. But the other part I yeah. want to talk about real quick before I forget is this idea of yes and, which I don't know if you connect with this or not. But being a person who is artistically, art, arts are part of your inclined. part of your background, inclined. Uh, so one of the things you learn in improvisation, right, is the 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 question of yes and. Yes, right? and to, yeah, to which move, is where I got that from. Right, from to improv. move, right, to move that question forward without without stifling it. And yeah. isn't that an interesting way of looking at faith? Yeah, doing this absolutely. Yes and. Mm-hmm. Well, because I think for so much of of um of of how I grew up, it was very much so. Um, here's here's the box here. Here's the binary. Here's here's where we exist, and here's what we believe exists within. Um, and mm. there's going outside of that means to go away from is so much of what I was raised with. And so when I started to go outside of it, I didn't feel that then reverse of going away from it as much as I was told I was going to experience. So then I was like, oh, maybe it is some of the things that exist within here, in addition to other things. And my background before poetry is theater and acting, which is where I got all this exercise of, you know, we would play these improvisations 
organization games where you cannot say no to the partner that you're with. You right. cannot say no. There aren't, you know, um, there aren't, you know, satellites falling out of the sky. You can only respond with yes and look at how bright they are. Yes. Right. And look at how infinite it feels. You know, you can only continue the conversation and that, that exercise and that, that game, if you will, per se is how I've just been trying to approach, um, my spirituality and my faith in God is like, yes, I still do love a worship song sometimes. And I also feel like I want to be in belonging spaces that include my blackness, that include my body, that includes my peers and their queerness. Like there's yes to those things. And I think there's more to it. And I think as an artist too, you know, I was, I was kind of given, I always say this, like Katy Perry, warning growing up, you know, of like you grow up in the church and then you start doing, you know, the worldly stuff and then your art starts becoming worldly and, and not godly. And so I grew up with this like warning and, and this tension. And I always felt like is, is arts not a, not a catalyst, not an opening to the more than, you know, to the yes. And, and I always felt that call and that draw. And I tried to keep it, you know, pretty conditioned and pretty only affiliated to churches, only affiliated to scripture, only affiliated to my private Christian university. And I kept getting pulled into the and spaces. And I, and I started to actually pay attention to maybe there, maybe there is a God thing here. And I, and I'm, and I started to just find more comfort in the and, um, and then, yeah, find that there was still a lot of fear around it because I didn't know, you know, because I was told that it wasn't, it still wasn't God, but I just kept being reminded of how much it was at the same time. I I find it really interesting that, you know, let's use Katy Perry uh, since you brought her up. I feel that some of the music that she puts out now, because I, first of all, I don't believe that she's left any kind of spiritualness behind. No. There's, uh, no. when you're, when that's part of your being, part of your heart, I say that the music that she's writing now is more spiritually based than what she sure. wrote when she was quote unquote a Christian artist, right? Sure. Uh, or yeah. some, or, or a band like you too, uh, mm-hmm. which most of the art, I believe everyone in the band are, again, in air quotes, Christians. But I uh-huh. think that they bring a spirituality to their music that a Christian artist can't bring, right? Yeah, if your first absolutely. label is a Christian artist, and then at, on top of that, you're a pop artist or whatever you are, uh, if you are uh, with, with with like you two or Katy Perry, is you are an artist first, and then your faith kind of is 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 melded into what you write. Yeah, right. it influences it, right? It certainly gives it depth. And um, right. I, I'll go back to something that Brian Zahn said. I think when we interviewed him once upon a time, but that that was that was his opinion why why a lot of Christian quote unquote Christian music and say quote unquote Christian cinema is bad is because <laughs> it's propaganda it's not art mm, you yeah know? And, um, and it only gets to stay labeled as Christian or as whatever else you want to label it as long as you stay within the parameters that they've set for you and you only say the things that you're supposed to say well art is supposed to challenge mm-hmm. right art is supposed to push boundaries and make us sometimes piss us off and sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so I love I love when artists do that because then they can do more than just hit you over the head with with a message. They can they can they can bury it someplace where you have to actually dig for it. And also, there's just so much Kirk Cameron you can take, right? You, I mean, there's a point where I I just I can't I can't see another movie with Kirk Cameron in it. I just can't. I just can't. I'm sorry, you've seen more than one. No, honestly, I haven't. But I've seen bits and pieces. I've never actually I've never actually watched any of his movies. Uh, but I've seen enough, right? I've seen uh, enough. My wife and I have been fireproof and I still hold that against I am, her. I am so oh. sorry. <laughs> was, oh my God, what a bad movie. And she tried to drive me to, to war room and I'm like, I'm not doing oh, it. Yeah. No more of this bullshit. Yeah. I'm done with bad Christian cinema. <laughs> it's, matter of fact, it's, it's, got, it's gotten so bad, the, the, just putting the word bad on it is... Is really redundant. I mean, it's right, so- <laughs> right. Well, there's this like um, I don't remember where it came from or what it was birthed from, but I remember this comment, especially as an artist, of being told, you know, like why are we make we're we're making these crappy things, we're making this really awful art, but we're putting a cross on it, so yay, you know, yay. like yeah. for yeah. the Lord, but it's not. 
good. It's not enriching. It's not exciting. There's no story. There's no depth to it. And so I, I learned like, why make a, you know, a crappy sh- something and put a cross on it? Why not just have something quality, um, something impactful, something, you know, um, you know, thought provoking and challenging that has this core to it, which is how I've always felt. Like, why do I have to put scripture in every poem and everything I'm doing when what I'm speaking from, that's that's the core of who I am. That's that connectedness to 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 the divine, to God, is is where all of this is being spilled or poured out of. And it's good, you know, so why then do I have to like reverse it and make it not so great? You know, like I just think of just like a lot of the Christian rap I grew up with or, or going to like K-Love um, workshops and uh, conferences and, and um, peer events and, and things like that. And it just like, it wasn't great, but it was Christian, you know, but like, why can't it, why can't it be like quality and and bring people into this deeper conversation. Yeah, um, yeah I don't think it has to suck. I don't. I, don't, no, I, don't think, we're doing, I, I think we're doing a disservice when it does. Yeah. yeah. But I think once you put it inside the camp of that, and it doesn't just right. apply to Christians. I think it could apply to everybody. But we just do it better or worse than anybody else. <laughs> is it has to be once you once you put so many limitations on it, once you've decided it has to be confined within this box and it has to be this and this. John and I were aspiring musicians for a long time, and you know we would have given our left arms or nah, not arms because we couldn't play. But anyway, we would have we would have given quite a bit our you know to to get signed by a Christian recording label, and and I'm so glad that never happened. I mean, partly because we were not that good, um, but also partly because. I have, I have other friends who have quote unquote made it in that world and the control that comes with that is stifling. And so I don't know. I just, I I still, I still, I still love the idea of art being a dissident kind of thing. And it's hard to be dissident when you're, when you're smack dab inside of the establishment. It, it, It just, I think it, I think it takes the teeth out of it. So, so, so that unraveling for you begins partly when you realize there's really no place for you inside of this small, confined version of, of, of religion, right? And so when you, when you, when you step out and you, you, I, I bring this up because you mentioned queerness, you mentioned some other things that would, you know, obviously inside of the church would be like, oh, you know, how, how old were we before we, you know, before I heard the word gay Christian and didn't go, well, that can't be. <laughs> Those yeah. two words don't go together. But all of a sudden, yeah. John's and my worlds have both kind of went, well, so was that was that kind of a like a uh, like a gradual unfolding then like certain things sure Good. yeah yeah no it definitely was a, um, a gradual so what what you read and what you what is or listen to in in the book was kind of the the chasm of it all. So the chasm of it was, was marrying a, a, a man who is willing to ask questions, who's willing to explore, who's willing to find the permission and space for me to also do those things. Even though I had already in small pieces, like, what do you mean I can't be a woman and have authority and connection to God and speak that to other people who are not just also women? Like, what do you mean I can't be an artist in spaces um, that are not Christian in it? still be considered, you know, um, like holy and worthy work. Like what do you, and, 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 um, having a mentor at my last church, you know, realize can queer people not only attend life groups, but can they also lead a life group? And then her leaving and coming out and marrying her best friend and me being left at this church, like, well, I'm seeing her, this mentor, this beautiful person, this person who has spiritually guided me, is everything she's saying now void because she's married to a woman? You know, like, is she no longer or any less of a pastor because she's married to a woman? And so there was these little point, um, if you will, that kind of then erupted in the last three, four years, the pandemic, um, marrying a man who I felt was my person that God had brought to me. And yet I was being told was not my person um, that God had brought to me was not a relationship um, that is centered, you know, and connected to divinity. And so it was all these little points that kind of then blew up, um, if you will, at in this last few years of just like I I have always known and felt and believed that the conversation 
was bigger, but now I'm actually living that that's the case. Um, and having always been kind of teetered on the arts, um, in conversation of just, you know, being around people who were queer. And I don't, I don't identify I as queer. I, I identify as straight, but so many people around me were experiencing those things. And can I be both? Can I be a Christian and can I be gay? And so it was really in the last few years, um, that I allowed myself to experience that fully to have those unfolding thoughts and then to do the actual work of unfolding and having a partner who we're now almost three years married um, and someone who I feel I can feel safe with and explore with, but that wasn't a reality before. I wasn't given a whole lot of spaces to ask questions, to explore because I was raised, God is not a God of you know, um, God is not a God of confusion. If there's, if there's doubts, if there's confusion, if there's things you're unsure of, that's not of God. And so, and I still wrestle with that, that trauma, you know, I still wrestle with like, Ooh, I'm not so certain and sure in my faith anymore. Am I so far, you know, from it? And I actually, one of the last international trips I did was to Israel in January of 2020. And I, I chose to go and do that instead of getting my yoga teacher training because I could see that my parents weren't fully ready for me to be a yoga teacher. (laughs) That wasn't, Christian. And so I went to Israel instead. And going then when I was in my space of deconstructing or un- unfolding was quite a mind trip. Um, and also going with other influencers, evangelical Christian influencers was awful. And so I'm like... <laughs> in Israel and I'm going to all these places that I've learned about, that I've read about in our Bible, our our tour guide is giving us the fullest history of it. And at the same time, the pastor of the trip is like texting us, well, don't believe that because that's not biblical or don't believe that because this is actually in the Bible and what he's saying is not. So I'm experiencing all this. And then like one of the cosmic moments was we finished a Shabbat dinner with a host family. And it was one of my favorite parts of the trip. The family was so beautiful. They were so kind. They fed 30 of us wild, um, just abrasive, you know, um, young adults. And um, we sang some songs. They sang some songs and we left. And I was like, I think that was my favorite part. And another person on my trip was like, yeah, I do too. And another girl goes, yeah, it's just like so sad. And we were like, what's sad? What did we miss? And she was like, it's just so sad they're going to hell. And I was like, oh, shit. I don't, I'm not there anymore. Like I went on this trip to prove that I was still her, (laughs) that I was still that thought, that I was still that belief. And that is not what I walked away with. And so there were definitely these little moments that just kind of like got put in my life, that got put in my story, that got put in in what was happening to me and then just kind of blew up. (laughs) Um, Not at once. I think it was very subtle, but because I never want to be like, oh, you know, my my husband's to blame for all this. I think he gave me the permission (laughs) to unfold. You know, he gave me the space and and the safety to ask the questions, to not know, to explore and wonder. But all of that kind of happened in the last four four or five years. Yeah. Yeah, I was, um, we're going back quite a ways, but like 1988, 1989, I went on a, a missions trip, right? I went to Jamaica. Uh, and, you know, the heathen of Jamaica needed you. <laughs> but, and, you know, and, and I'll even, I'll even defend a little bit because it was right after a really major hurricane had gone through Jamaica yeah, and there was a lot sure. of structural damage. And we were there obviously to preach the word, but we were also there uh-huh. to help rebuild this church camp that had, yeah. uh, had quite a bit of damage from the hurricane. I say all this to say that there was this one evening where obviously at night, uh, the women went to one part of the church, uh, one part of the camp. The men or the boys went to another part of the camp because obviously there was, it was co-ed, but obviously we slept in different areas. Well, we woke up the next morning to this just turmoil because there was this moment where the Jamaican girls had connected to the spirit in some way. And so they're praying, they're singing, they're chanting, they're dancing. And the Christian youth leaders that came put a stop to it because it wasn't godly enough for them. And that was where I was like, I don't really understand what we're doing anymore. 
I just don't because these people are connecting to the divine in a way that I don't understand, but that they do. And I was like, I, I was already on my way of checking out. But this was like one of the final nails in the coffin for me, where it's like, I, and I went and I talked to our youth pastors who were there with us. It's like, I don't think you understand what happened there. I don't think you understand how important that was. This crossover, you know, all they, all they saw was, okay, well, in Jamaica, there's a lot of voodoo, whatever you want to call it. And that's all they saw. That's all they saw. They were connecting to the divine in the, in the way that they knew. Mm-hmm. And we just don't understand it. And I, it was for me, it was like, yeah, I just, I don't understand you anymore. Yeah. Because you don't, you don't allow space for people to connect to the divine in the best way that they know how. Yeah. You think and in that a way that the, looks different. Mm-hmm. Right. So we only know a white evangelical, you know, church version of connecting to the divine. And anything outside of that is heretical you know, quote unquote, satanic, follows under the black magic. And I, as they're discussing and and describing to me what happened, I saw none of that. All I saw was a beautiful moment of reaching out to the divine through dance and music, which as Nat spoke earlier, Nat and I are musicians. So I found joy in that and they found fear. Sure, right. And and that's, that's, that's where I'm like, okay, I don't really understand if I can connect with you anymore the church universal because you guys are so separated from the rest of the world on how it is, what it means to be spiritual, right? I mean, we just, we have one answer and one answer only. And if you don't fit within our little box, then you're, you're just wrong. Then it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that, that was the start. That was the start of my deconstruction back in like 88, 89, before that word even existed. And, you know, it was a long journey. And, you know, I'm not going to go over it again because our podcast has heard it many, many times. But yes, yes, yes uh, we have. <laughs> <laughs> but what I, what I would like to, you know, off of that, I would like to talk a little bit about, about your book and how mm-hmm. this idea of unfo- the, the unfolding then you know, with this idea of these, and, and they're very, you know, they're easy to follow steps. If yeah. you want to call them that, I don't, I, you know, I don't, sure. I don't want people to think, and, and, and we talked a little bit about this off, offline before we started. I don't want anyone to think that this is that typical self help book because it's mm-hmm. not. It mm-hmm. really isn't. Take the time to read the book. Take the time to hear the story, your story, her story as she, as she allows us and gives us permission into this story through words and poetry. But how, how did this, how did, how did you come up with these, even these steps, if you want to call them that? Yeah, um, I call them phases. Um, and just overall, the unfolding was my extension of deconstructing. I kind of, in the last few years where it's really blown up and when everyone was talking about it and it just was this uproar of a conversation um, and I sat in these in these strange worlds and kind of still in church and still still not in church and then at an affirming church and then also not at an affirming church and really just trying to figure out um, what was happening. I the the word itself, I being a words person, being a poet, um, it was hard to adapt as my own. It was hard to feel like I don't deconstructing felt it seems so harsh. <laughs> you know, it seems so and it was get, getting such um, you know, from other worlds, such a negative connotation. It became a sermon point for all these people. It became, you know, if you're doing this and you're X, Y, and Z. And so all in all of that, I was like, how do, where, where do I fit in this? You know, and so the unfolding comes from, you know, being told you're different. Your faith is not what it was. You're changing, you're this and you're that. And I didn't feel like this brand new person. I didn't feel like I was just this unrecognizable being. I just felt like I was like, shedding and peeling back these pieces of um, what I was raised with, what I was taught to believe, what I was conditioned with. And I felt like I was finally shedding and peeling back those things and revealing um, who I felt I've always been, who I felt I was always walking towards and becoming. Um, and in doing that I it is where the phases c- come from. You know, the awakening is that moment of like, oh, shoot, I don't believe that, you know, anymore. Like, I don't identify with that anymore. Like, this doesn't fit or make sense to me anymore. 
And that's really freaking scary, especially for those of us who grew up in this. And so much of my identity, I was raised knowing that I was Christian above everything and all things else, not black, not a woman, you know, not an artist. I was just this. So adapt, um, you know, taking my identity out of that was just excruciating almost. Um, and so that's the awakening. Um, and then we eclipse because it's, there's these shadow aspects of, of who we were, um, and who we're becoming that are almost crossing each other. And you're trying to figure out which one is me and which one was I was told needed to be me. I was conditioned and thinking needed to be me. Um, and then we get to the point of illuminating. We shed light on what is and what isn't ours to claim anymore. We shed light on the reality as if like that actually was really painful for me to be taught for me to believe about myself. Um, and then we start to mend. I, I bring up the art of kintsugi, which is this Japanese art of taking clay pieces, of taking uh, pieces of broken things and and connecting it with this like gold glue, this gold, um, you know, um, a piece like it's, it's not quite a liquid, but it's a liquid almost in a, this mosaic art form, if you will. So I'm taking the fact that I really do still feel like I like being in a church. You know, I still like being in a space where I can sing worship, but I also don't want to be in it where it's negating my body as a part of my spirituality, where it's negating my blackness as part of my spirituality, where it's negating my sister's, you know, queerness. And so then it was like, okay, I'm taking a little bit of that and I'm taking a little bit of this and I'm leaving that and I'm taking this and I'm and and that's when we mend. And then we return. We return to either whatever concept or idea of God doesn't feel harmful. Um, and ultimately for me, it was returning to myself. In this phase, I couldn't identify what was God, what was me, what was my mentors, what were pastors, what were all these other people's voices. And I needed to return to like, I have trust this aspect of who I am. I have trust this gut um, orchestrating and, and leading up until this point, and I can continue to do that. And so those phases are almost like the phases of grief. They're never cyclical. Uh, and they're always cyclical. They're not linear. We experience them all at once, one at a time, you know, and not in that order that I presented. Um, but that was just in which I experienced my own unfolding. Those were the phases I feel like I encountered um, and hopefully allowing that to be um, a guidance or a help for acknowledging like, oh, I'm in this eclipsing, shadowing season and I want to get to the illuminating aspect of shedding light into what serves and what doesn't serve, but I'm here now. And so just being able to give name to things in a spaces of not being able to do so. Yeah. I love that imagery of the of the pottery. One of the, I've, I've used that you know a couple of times in illustrations, and always what was cool to me is in with inside of that art form, you're not interested in covering up brokenness, brokenness. right? Mm-hmm. You're not interested in 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 putting that thing back together in whatever illusory sense it was there before. No, no, no. We're gonna we're gonna go ahead and highlight the places yeah. where, where where we're broken and where we've mended. Yeah. Um, because all of yeah. that adds beauty to everything, right? It's uh, yeah. uh, That's one of the things that another another aspect of church life that drove me absolutely crazy was this insistence all the time that everyone present the best versions of themselves all the time. And it was just, you know, we, we were all... It, it's actually a little ironic that Christian movies are so bad because we're all such damn good actors. <laughs> <laughs> Christian, Christian yeah. cinema should be amazing. We, or, we, mm-hmm. I've been taught since I was, you know, since, since I was old enough to realize that I was supposed to perform on some level that I could sort of move in and out of different spaces because I knew how to behave and what the expectations were. And you damn well better never admit that you that you struggle or that there's a problem or that there's, you know. So yeah, I I I, I just. I like the imagery of it. Every time I think of that, I can picture the, the the first vase I saw that was made like that with the with the gold and you know basically adhesive, keeping all those pieces and putting them back. And I love it. So I just I think, and I also really like anybody who takes a large concept like deconstruction recognizes it's kind of spiraling a little bit, you know, or beginning to take on anyway the word maybe becoming problematic and saying, okay, well, how how does this work continue? if we can break out of the rut of calling it that. Now, I've just written a book that has the word in it, so I'm hoping it doesn't fade too soon. But <laughs> I feel like I'm getting on the very tail end of this whole craze. But but I like that you can, 
you can continue that same sort of substantive work yeah, without falling into the trap of, okay, well, that's just another, you know, deconstruction thing. Um, right. I actually felt like we were gaining some legitimacy when we began to be straw man by religious people who didn't understand deconstruction, who then begin to say this deconstruction claims X, Y, and Z. And, and then it was clear they'd never even looked into it. It was for them a talking point that they could just, you know, create a, you know, a caricature of yeah, people who yeah. deconstruct. Just you to know, scare the shit right. out of right. the shit out of their people. congregation, right? Right. right. If, you, if, you, right. if you, you know, if you if you start reading Brian McLaren, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna turn gay or something. Um, <laughs> right? Or you, I don't know. Like yeah, definitely. Next thing you know, you're going to be at the nightclub and you're right. going to be, you know, everything's going right. to go off the rails because you read that one book and it started you down a slippery slope. So anyway, all, all of that was just to say, I, I, I'm appreciative of you putting a new spin on that. And obviously you have to, as an artist, take that thing and make it your own and, and find a way to communicate that in a way that, might be more helpful and beneficial. So I think that's phenomenal. Well, and, and I want to I want to talk a little bit about what you talk about in, during the the pandemic, and then the uh, the Black Lives Movement. You mean which, the pandemic, uh, John? The pandemic. The pandemic. <laughs> you mean the one that Biden orchestrated, and then yeah, when he stuff. wasn't in office. And then, that one? And, then, yeah. and then Pfizer came along and and genetically changed all of us into mutants. But I mean, for for me, it's just, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, yes, that's gonna get yes, us, that's all, gonna get all kicked, of that. That's gonna get us kicked off YouTube. I was kidding. Uh, the algorithm does not sense sarcasm, so we're, <laughs> it doesn't. It really doesn't. We'll just stop does recording not. this one. We're all just. It's I'm not. joking. I love the mask. No, I'm just kidding. Well, <laughs> I, I want to talk. <laughs> you want to talk? I'm sorry. Every once in a while, this just descends into chaos, and it's my I know, fault. It really does. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> you want to talk like, about the pandemic? There's a couple things I want to talk about here. One is uh, specifically the Black Lives Movement that came out of this pandemic, right? Which was problematic on both sides, meaning it definitely gave white evangelical fundamentalists an argument. It's like, well, look at look at these people. They're telling us that we need to wear masks. They tell us that we need to social distance and look at them protest without masks. They're standing, you know, one foot apart from each other. They're causing all this violence, blah, 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 even yeah, though whatever. Their, their, their prodigal son, Martin Luther King, if they want to actually look into his, into any of the things he said, uh, and I'm going to misquote this. I'm going to, and I apologize, but it, it's something to the point of, uh, protest or violence is the, is the voice of the unheard, right? Which is a, which is a Martin Luther King Jr. quote. But they, they'll they never tell you that part. They'll only tell you the things where he says, you know, you need to right. love, you need to right. be peaceful, blah, 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 blah. Don't ever look into anything that he had to talk about when it come, came to actual social matters, when it came against black and white, right? So on top of that, and you talk about this a little bit, we talk about white tears, right? White people coming in and, and trying to cry alongside of you like we understand the plight of the black person. And we want to, we want to, we want to cry on your shoulder because we now feel so deeply about the pain that you're in at this moment, regardless that this has been hundreds of years, hundreds of years. I say all that to say, because I, I need to, I need to, I need to put a caveat on this. The poem that you wrote about hashtags as tombstones was one of the hardest things I've ever read because we've all done it. Every single one of us quote unquote, and this is in quotes, white allies to the, to the, to the Black Lives Movement. We've hashtagged every one of these names, right? We've hashtagged Ahmaud Aubrey. We've hashtagged Breonna Taylor. We've hashtagged George Floyd as if that means shit. If that, that, as if that means anything. See, I put a hashtag at the bottom of my post where I'm saying Black Lives Matter and then I hashtag all these people. Like that fucking matters. And like you said, we move from that to what well, we did our part. Now we're going to go off and pretend like nothing ever happened, right? And that's that's the scary shit. Is that we we don't have your back when it comes down to long term, and that's where. And I'd like to talk about that a little bit if you're okay with that. Is just what what can we do? I'm not saying we have the answer. We don't have the answer. Right, right. But and I, and really I don't even me. know sometimes if if um 
if I have if I have the answer, I think when I I think about specifically that concept, I think about how a, such a benefit and a deficit social media is and can be sometimes, sure. you know, yeah. especially in and it's so sticky because in that setting that's all we had, you know, to connect, to, to be, to converse, to, to raise question, to, you know, seek advocacy, social media. I mean, if we think about it from 2020 to 2022, like that was, that was the world right there. That's what we had because we didn't have the physical space, you know, to be around each other and to be in rooms with each other. And so we, all we had was this cell phone, you know, and this screen. And as beneficial as was, that was, it also was really a deficit, you know? And um, I think so much of that conversation of just having other peers or having other, you know, um, white counterparts either call or text or or ask me, I think the conversation I always come back to is it's not, it's not new to us. So I need you to get to the point where it's not new to you and not to the point where you're numb to it, but to the point where you get that this is continuous work. I can't stop being Black, but you can stop hashtagging these names. Mm -hmm. You can stop posting Black squares. Um, But this is something that I live you know, I'm I'm very fortunate to not live it every, every day or to not be faced with it every day more so. I live with it every day, but I'm not faced with it every day until something happens or until something comes up or until my identity or my blackness or my femin- femininity is questioned because of that being the society and the world we live in. And also to realize how um, when we say, when the conversation of racism comes up, that we realize it's systemic, which means it's ingrained and living and breathing in everything. So actively in every day, we need to be trying to do our best to uproot something that is a system, you know, and, and that means expanding the conversation. That means making it so that that one Black person you follow on Instagram, whether it be myself or Morgan Harper Nichols or, um, you know, Rachel, or whoever, that those are not your only points of contact when it comes to this conversation, that it's, you know, happening um, in your dining room, at your dining room tables, in your homes, in your, you know, boardrooms, wherever, um, because we're not in those spaces all the time. We're not in those conversations all the time as, as Black people. And so I think just remembering that it has to be continuous and then we all have to not grow numb to it and unaware to it, because I think that will be our biggest day downfall is when we become numb to it, um, when we stop listening to it, um, when we ignore it. And I think Brianna Taylor for me was one of the hardest having mostly sisters, um, having mostly, you know, um, sisters and, and women in my family. That one just felt so personal. <laughs> it felt so, it was probably one of the most personal um, encounters I feel like I've had in a, in a really long time. And so um, I think for me, she kind of got, she was a few of my poems in that last year. Um, and so, yeah, I think it just, it has to be a continuous conversation. Um, it has to be a thing that's not just one off. Like there's the pass the mic, there's the follow the black creator and all of that is not, none of that is beneficial because it's not sustainable. So when we want to figure out benefit, we have to think about sustainability. How does this keep going? And that it's not just this one off thing or experience or time. It has to be sustainable and functional in order to actually be systemically uprooting. Well, and sadly too, uh, we see how much the patriarchy plays within this. Brianna Taylor's voice or, or name was, was one of the first to somewhat disappear, right? And I, and I, it's, it's, it's super hard to talk about this because mm-hmm. that I don't want, and I don't think any of us want to say, that George Floyd's name doesn't deserve to be spoken over and over again, or, sure. or Ahmaud Aubrey's voice doesn't need to be spoken over and over again. And and, sure. and the decisions made within those courts are definitely a move in the right direction. It's still a long way to go. But Breonna Taylor, I mean, her voice was silenced. Her name was silenced. And it's because even within this, there is a patriarchy, matriarchy system that says, yes, even though, yes, these are both people of color, this is a man and this is a woman, right? And then, God forbid, you top, you put on top of that 
But this person happens to be transgender or gay or lesbian, right? That's, that's even gonna, that's gonna push this conversation even farther. And I feel like, you know, in, in the poems, specifically within your poetry, you talk about this, right? You talk about, first of all, the, you know, the Black Lives Movement, but you also talk about, you know, not with, you know, then within that, where women's roles are in that, right? Um, I mean, we talk about, you know, we can talk about women's suffrage, right? So women giving the right to vote, but, uh, uh, but in that, there were black women working towards helping that, and then they were silenced. And, but that's how we were taught. Yeah. You know, as white right. middle class, well, you know, uh, you, you know, high school students, we weren't talked, we weren't told about, uh, all we were talked about or told about was like Susan B. Anthony, right? This sure. white suffrage person. But yeah. there was other voices that were silenced, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What is the quote? That's like the most disrespected person in America is a black woman. <laughs> yeah. Um, the most hyper visible and the most invisible all at the same time. Right. Um, yeah. Because we're not only holding both racism but we're also holding racism and sexism in the right. same breath and how exhausting, you know, that is continuously and still to this day, you know, like there's a lot of work coming out about the Crown Act, which is just to show that Black women's hair and discrimination on how they wear their hair and how we wear our hair cannot be included within the workforce, you know, like that's just now becoming as public and as known today in 2023, you know, and so there, it seems like as much as the progression and as much as things are happening, um, Black women will sadly and unfortunately, we will always fall at the end of the receiving freedom end, which is exhaust, exhausting. Yeah, It must be. It must be. That, that was several years ago. I remember, I remember hearing a, um, a pastor preach at a, at a church conference that I went to. And um, the only, the only uh, Black preacher the entire time we were there, right? And he's they gave him the opening spot. He got to speak first. And uh, um, his I forget his name, Miles, doesn't matter. Um, John would remember, he has a better memory. But anyway, he spoke to a largely white audience in a huge mega church uh, outside of Las Vegas and spoke for about 30 to 40 minutes about privilege. And you could have heard a pin drop in that wow. place. Wow. It was for, I'm sure for him and for a lot of people in that room, it was some of those uncomfortable conversations they, they'd had. And it was the only thing about those three days I remember mm. because it, it hit home, you know? And one of the things I remember him talking about was what you said sort of early on in this was that, you know, listen, the, the, the definition, the, one of the definitions of privilege for him was, um, you get to go home and not think about this. Most of you in this room get to go home and decide whether you pay attention to this or not. I live this every day. I live this when my sons leave the house in their cars and I worry that an encounter with a police officer might not go well. They have to teach their sons lessons that, that my, my, John's and my dad never taught us. I mean, taught us to be, you know, if we ever got pulled over by the cops, be respectful. Okay. That's just so you don't get a ticket, not so you don't get shot. Right. 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 <laughs> and so yeah. it, it must be exhausting. That, so I, I, I mean, to the, to the degree that I can, I feel that there's something to, keeping the conversation going. And we've had the distinct privilege, John and I have, of having several people on the podcast who are, who are in that world, who have, who have echoed the sentiments over and over again, and who are doing, you know, uh, Lisa Sharon Harper was, was, mm-hmm. was here. And, mm-hmm. you know, just her work as a historian is, is awesome. Um, let's talk about the other work you're doing, though, besides just the books. You also have Spoken Word. Uh, John mentioned you've done some short films. So uh, in my Modeling. in my typical way, John, I'll say like this: uh, well, What's up with that? <laughs> Um, yeah, well, most my um, I started as as an actor. I started in the theater world. I went to an arts high school and studied theater. In addition to my math and science and all of that, um, from my sophomore year to my my senior year, and then when I graduated, I double majored in psychology and theater. Um, fully thinking that I would go more the acting theatrical route, um, and then spoken word kept showing up in those spaces and kind of veering me into opposite spaces. And so um, I, I graduated in 2015 with a with a bachelor's in psychology with an emphasis in theater, ended up going fully into just 
doing poetry um, at different conferences and things like that. But my heart has always been um, a thespian. My heart has always been connected to the stage, to to theatrics um, and to storytelling um, in a way that's outside of myself. And so in the last few years where I built this career predominantly of, of poetry um, with a sprinkle of modeling, um, I've always taken a class or, or been connected to acting. And so um, I think having my book feels like such a really beautiful, not full circle or closing point, because I'm always going to be a writer. I'm always going to be a poet. Um, but it feels like something that I can kind of like use as a, a as a launch pad or as an extension of, of the artist I want to be and the stories I want to tell. And so um, poetry is a very vulnerable and, and intimate thing. And I, and I like to say I'm tired of being myself. Like I kind of just want to be someone else for a moment. Um, and so that's why I love theater. And that's why I love short films. So Right now, I'm um, mostly commercially, which is very fun. Um, so you can find me probably on your television, either in a Starbucks commercial or an Etsy one playing chess with my 13-year-old son um, or in TJ Maxx playing with my hat. Um, and then my goal is to do more TV and film, hopefully within the, the next year or two, um, all the while still being a poet, still being um, an author. And yeah, there's lots of room and opportunity for creativity in LA. So I kind of just, I don't tend to say no um, to things if it sparks my interest or if it feels like something I would, I would be good at also. Yeah. Yeah. So Renaissance woman, I love it. You know, I try, I try. When when you're done mastering all those things, you'll start sculpting or something. And (laughs) like, why not? What the hell? I'll do that. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I'll master all this other stuff. Uh, Right. I, man, I just, I, I love that. I, I love that you're in that space too, you know, geographically where that's all sort of at your fingertips too. So there's a, there's so much there to explore. So yeah, I'm, I just, we just want to make sure that there are, so there are things of yours that John said he watched. Did you watch those on YouTube, John? Are there other, yeah. other, yes. uh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. We'll, YouTube, we'll, my website, you can probably go there and there's a pretty yeah. central hub for spoken word or for, for more acting things. Yeah. I love it. That's, I'm, I've become a pretty big fan of that. One of the, one of the first interviews we had um, with someone else who did spoken word was with a, a, a woman named December Rose. And uh, she wrote a, she wrote a, a book. She self published a book called The Church Can Go to Hell. Ooh. Which is <laughs> right. If not for the title alone, yes, Ooh. by that book. Um, wow. And then, and then we had her on, and then she she actually did a couple things for. I, I was I, I don't know. Just there's something about John. John mentioned that before we were, before we started recording that he asked you about had you done an audible, mm-hmm. and he said so. You're going. This will be released on an audible, and that you had actually done the narration for that. And so one of the things that I didn't want to I didn't want to forget to mention was John said it was really helpful to him to to go and watch some of your videos, listen to some of your spoken word, and then come back to the book. And then to that, to then read that poetry kind of with the sound of the cadence of your voice in his mind to say, oh, that's the rhythm of how these words get said. This is how, this is how she would have said it and go, okay, that's so much of poetry is about rhythm and cadence, you know, and if we don't yeah. know. Terry Wildman, yeah. one of the main um, translators of the, the uh, First Nations version of the New Testament. He then asked if he could read some of it to us. And there's, we all have a cadence. We all have a way we speak, right? That is either culturally or geographically who we are. And I had read a lot of this uh, First Nations um, New Testament. It didn't I didn't hear the cadence of how it was spoken or, or in my head until he read it to us with that First Nations, that indigenous voice. And there's like this whole different, it, it brings a whole different level of understanding. And that comes with uh, people who write poetry. I could read poetry all day, but if I don't hear how they meant it to be spoken or read or heard, it doesn't mean as much until I hear their voice. And I, I'm, you know, I feel bad that I can't remember the name of the of the the young lady who who did the um, the poem at the uh, inauguration for Biden. Amanda uh, Dorman. Dorman. Hey, Jinx, show me a coke. <laughs> um, but if I if I had if I had just read that first, yeah, without her cadence and the way she spoke that, it would. I don't know if it would have meant as much. Yeah, definitely. As hearing it from her, right? I mean, I have mm-hmm. an audible version of that now. 
mm-hmm. because they put yeah. it out as a book and then you could get it as yeah. audible. And that's, yep. that's, you know, that's the, that's the way I'd rather hear it. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's, and I would say the same for your, for your poetry. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely say um, get the audiobook and the physical book. The the physical book will have, like you've seen, visual elements to it right. that I don't read out loud, you know? So right. those um, more graphic looking or, or more um, put together um, quotes and things like that, I don't read those in the book, um, but I read almost everything else. Um, and also just like as a, as a predominantly spoken word poet, I do I do write in space in, in weird ways um, that are kind of like my little notes or my little hints as to how I would verbally say it, you know, or where I would pause or or where I would introduce a, a cadence, if you will. But it does sound very different <laughs> when you attach it to to an actual voice. And so, um, yeah, you can do the audiobook. I also have um, an EP of poetry on Spotify. So you can find more of my voice on Spotify or iTunes or wherever you listen to um, music and podcasts and things like that as well. But um, yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely a, a tone in in a space um, that I I feel proud of, um, but the audio book I'm I'm pretty proud of as well. So yeah, yeah, I'm 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 with John. I was thinking of Amanda Gorman when you when you said that, and I was yeah. thinking of sitting in front of my television watching the inauguration, and and watching this this very young, um, yeah. poised, um, yeah. and well, I mean just just and just the way that she. I, I'm just always a fan of how people put words together. You know, I just, I love, I love people who can do that well. So, and obviously as a poet laureate, I would hope that you can do that. But, um, but everyone brings their own sensibilities to that. Right. And everyone brings their own, their own experiences to that. And I, I and that's where the value is for me is finding out, um, as much as, as much as you can through, through the words and, and not just that, but how they're put together and, um, the imagery that you, that you create with that. So, and I'm just a, yeah, I'm I'm just a huge a huge fan of that, and consequently a huge fan of yours. So um, <laughs> I, thank you. I appreciate that. I, man, this is this has been awesome, John. What do you say, bud? This yeah. is a. Oh, I was excited. I was excited to talk to you after reading your book, um, and then, like I said, w- listening to your spoken word, watching um, a little bit of your uh, your acting, uh, which was uh, really really good. Yeah, I mean, I wish I had a tenth of your talent. I really do. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you so um, much. And anybody who uh, is listening, I mean, there's just so many recommendations, and obviously, we'll add this into the show notes. Uh, first of all, buy the book. You, yeah, for uh, sure. There's like zero chance you're going to be disappointed. Zero. Go listen to the uh, to her spoken word. Go watch, like, like she said, either through her website or YouTube. You can find her. She's on Internet Movie Database. That's actually how I found <laughs> you first. I do have an IMDb. You have arrived. <laughs> Holy mackerel. So I went to like, for, for real folks here. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. So I, I went to that site and then found the name of the, uh, some wow. of the movie shorts you did. And then so cool. I used that and then found them on YouTube. Um, wow, so that's awesome. There's, there's, there's a, we live in a we live in a time where all of this is really easy to do. It's all there's, possible, man. It's all right there. There's, there's, there's no yes. reason. There's zero reason to say I couldn't find her work. There's yeah. zero reason yeah. for that. Yeah. Uh, it, or if if there if you can find a reason, it's that you're just lazy <laughs> wow. and you're not willing to do. Are you throwing shade yeah. on like half I of am. our audience? Maybe, maybe. You cannot, you cannot afford to, to, to piss off those well, I mean, seven people. Right, this, right, right. This, 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 will, this will drop, you know, outside of uh, Black History Month, but we are recording during Black History Month. And one, you know, like yeah. one of the first things I did with, you know, within my, our TikTok page is one of the first things I said when I did our, I do, you know, I did a, a TikTok of, you know, on February 1st is like, okay, this is, this is, this is the easiest thing for you to do. <laughs> Read books by black authors. Listen to music by black artists. Visit stores and businesses run by black owners. These are the, there's not much, it's easy. And guess what you're going to find? I mean, so I've been doing this now for quite a few years. You know, I don't, I, I don't only do it during Black History Month, but you know, I definitely reach out for voices that are LGBTQIA plus, uh, BIPOC, all of that. I have got a better understanding just by going to my here, here's a here's a hint for anybody. Just get a Libby account with through your library, and there are so many books available for you. And shockingly enough, 
they break down the genre already for you. <laughs> it's not that hard. It really isn't. You can find black nonfiction. You can buy, find black fiction. You can find black oh, science fiction, which is what? just amazing. They've made it easy. What's that called again, John? Libby? What's, what's, Libby. what's, a, what's that? I don't read, I know. so I don't know what we, you're talking we should, about. We should get like some profit from this, but Libby is just a way that connects to your <laughs> library card. It just connects to yeah, your library cool. card. John, I live in Texas. We don't have, we don't have libraries here. Yeah. We burn, we burn books in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow. Anyway, we just want to, we just wanted to wrap this up and say, first of all, thank you, uh, for being here. Uh, thank you for sharing your, your, your book with us. We really appreciate that. And as just to remind people, if you're listening, to support by doing all those things that John mentioned before, um, but also specifically support Arielle and her work and buy her book. Thank you for listening to This Is Not Church. Be sure to rate and review the podcast on your platform of choice. If you would like to partner with us, visit patreon.com slash thisisnotchurch where you will receive exclusive content such as early access to episodes, videos of upcoming episodes, and live Q&A sessions. Be sure to check out our Facebook group or follow us on Twitter and Instagram. All the links are in the show notes. We'll be back soon with another episode.